Hello and welcome to the third of a series of video tutorials exploring the new features of Forkinel 3. My name is Richard Harrison, author of Forkinel. Uh, in this video I'll be guiding you through the process of smoothing your data to produce a fork diagram using both the simple and very fork smoothing options. We'll begin as usual by loading in a fork data set. This data comes courtesy of Nono Lasku. It's a lake sediment containing a high quantity of magnetotactic bacteria. As we load the data in, we see that it's automatically corrected for drift. Uh, the first point artifact is set to be removed, and uh, the lower branch has been subtracted to yield this set of difference forks. We can adjust any of these choices using the fork control panel. For more information, see video two of this series. To smooth the data and produce a process fork diagram, we start by checking the simple smooth option and then clicking change smoothing. The first number you're asked for is the smoothing factor. The smoothing factor defines the size of a square smoothing box which surrounds each output point in the fork diagram. Measurement data points that land inside the smoothing box are used to perform a weighted least squares fit to the magnetization surface using a second order polynomial function. The result of this fit is then used to calculate the second derivative of the magnetization surface, which is the desired fork distribution. In Fork and L3, the square smoothing boxes are defined in the HCHU coordinate system. This is the same coordinate system that's used for very fork smoothing. And this coordinate system differs from the HAHB coordinate system that you may uh, use conventionally. This is significant because for a given smoothing factor, there are roughly half as many data points that land in the box when you're using the HCHU convention compared to the uh, conventional scheme, the HAHB system. So for this reason, you will find that you may need larger smoothing factors in Fork and L3 to achieve the same degree of smoothing this is essentially just a, a different definition of the smoothing factor, but it's one you should be aware of if you want to compare results using Fork and L3 with those from different processing software. The second number you see here is the output resolution factor of the fork diagram. A value of 1 creates the highest resolution output, with the output grid calculated at the same resolution as the input grid of measurement points. This should be used when producing publication-ready diagrams. However, in order to speed up the fork calculation, especially in the beginning as you explore what the optimum smoothing factor should be, you should increase this factor so that output points are calculated only for every second, third, fifth, or even tenth point. Increasing this number increases the speed of the calculation by decreasing the output resolution. For very large fork data sets, i.e. those containing more than 500 forks, you may want to start with an output factor of 5 or 10. For more normal data sets containing 200 to 300 forks, start with an output factor somewhere between 2 and 5. We'll start here with a, a very low value of 2 for the smoothing factor. Uh, and we'll do this deliberately to illustrate one of the common errors that you might see pop up from time to time. And I'm going to set the output resolution factor to 2. Clicking continue, we'll see a very noisy fork diagram is produced. And an error window pops up saying that you must have at least as many data points as fit parameters. This warning appears to tell us that there are some parts of this fork diagram where there were not enough input data points landing inside your smoothing box to perform the least squares fit properly. This is usually a problem for points along the edges of the fork diagram, where there are fewer input points to, to land in the box. And this is especially an issue along this uh, vertical edge here if you've set the remove first and last option, because that removes an extra set of data points uh, along this edge. Sometimes we can just ig simply ignore this error if the results look fine, but we should really try to eliminate it by increasing the smoothing factor. In this case, a value of 4 is required before the error goes away. Uh, a value of 3 is needed if, if we do not have the last point replace, um, first last point replace option checked. Okay, so we now see the process fork diagram. It consists of a sharp horizontal ridge, a broad noisy background signal. 
Increasing the smoothing factor allows us to bring out the details of this smooth background, but inevitably leads to the over-smoothing of the sharp central ridge. We can explore different smoothing factors manually to see the effect on the ridge and the background, uh, or more conveniently, we can use the automated Explore Optimum Smoothing Factor option. To do this, I would typically place my process fork diagram over on the right-hand side of the screen, and go to the Explore Optimum Smoothing Factor option here. I'll choose a starting smoothing factor, an ending factor, and an increment, and an output resolution factor. When we run this, you'll see that the different smoothing factors are applied to the data and you can track qualitatively how the ridge and the background signals change as the, increased, uh, as the smoothing is increased. Clearly, the ridge is being artificially broadened in the vertical direction by increased smoothing, but interestingly not uh, changed very much in the horizontal direction. The background signal is becoming much better defined and noise-free with increasing smoothing, and its overall shape really doesn't change very much, even at high smoothing factors. The graph that's produced over on the left here provides a metric that is sensitive to how much the fork diagram distorts as you increase that smoothing factor. We call this the delta fork correlation factor, and it's calculated by looking at the difference between the fork diagram at one smoothing factor and the fork diagram calculated at the previous smoothing factor. So how much has the fork diagram changed between those two? That delta fork correlation factor is simply the, the standard deviation of the autocorrelation function of this difference fork. It sounds complicated, but the principle is quite simple. If, if we, as we increase the smoothing factor, the noise is reduced, but the underlying fork diagram doesn't distort, then this delta fork correlation factor will remain small and flat as we change the smoothing factor. However, if increased smoothing changes the underlying fork diagram, then the delta fork correlation function will start to increase. Here we see that the factor rises almost immediately as we start to increase smoothing, and that's caused by this very obvious broadening of the vertical broadening of the ridge. And this tells us that we really need to keep the vertical smoothing factor on this ridge region to a minimum in order to preserve that uh, feature. At the same time, however, we'd like to use high smoothing factors in the background to bring out the details of the background signal. And this combination can be achieved very nicely using the VeryFork option. To use VeryFork, we uncheck the simple smooth button and click Change Smoothing you'll now see all of the VeryFork smoothing parameters. By default, these are set up to yield identical smoothing to the last simple smooth parameters that you set. In this case, we have a constant smoothing factor of 15. The first parameter here, SC0, allows us to set the horizontal smoothing factor to be used along the vertical ridge. For now, we'll keep this uh, at a value of 15. The second parameter here, SB0, allows us to set the vertical smoothing factor that's to be used along the central ridge. This we want to dramatically reduce in order to avoid this vertical broadening of the ridge signal. So for now, I'll set this down to a value of 5. These two parameters, SC1 and SB1, set the horizontal and vertical smoothing factors to be used in the background regions. These are away from the vertical and central ridge regions. These two numbers should, in almost all cases, be the same. In this case, we'll leave these at 15. These two parameters here, the lambda factors, set the rate at which the horizontal and vertical background smoothing parameters increase with increasing horizontal and vertical distance from the origin. For now, we'll keep these both at zero so that we're using constant smoothing factors in the background away from the ridge regions. Finally, you have the output resolution factor as before. And you also have the option here to specify a vertical offset parameter for cases where the central ridge does not appear exactly on the HU equals zero axis. Pressing continue, we see that the central ridge is now no longer broadened, while the vertical background signals remain nicely smoothed. We can explore reducing that vertical smoothing along the ridge even further 
a value of 2 or 3 appears to be the minimum value usable before obvious artifacts start appearing. Next, we do a similar exercise for the vertical ridge. We can reduce that horizontal smoothing factor along the vertical ridge to a value of 5, but we'll see that this starts to introduce a negative signal which looks like a, an artifact. Increasing this back up to a value of 10 reduces this uh, artifact. At this point, I'd be quite happy with the smoothing parameters, and we might choose to stop at this point and perhaps calculate the fork diagram at the output resolution factor of 1. Alternatively, you can explore increasing these lambda factors. This should be done with some caution, however, as inappropriate values for the lambda factors can lead to stripy artifacts, which are caused by the fact that the smoothing box is no longer square, but very rectangular in shape. This is most often seen when lambda factors are used in combination with a background smoothing factor that is too low. For example, if we set the background smoothing to 5, and a lambda factor to 0.1, we'll see that the background becomes extremely stripy. This stripy artifact can be avoided by increasing the background smoothing. In this case, I would start with a value of 10, which is the value we settled on for the vertical ridge earlier on. Let's set the background parameters equal to that. With lambda still set at 0, We'll get a similar fork to before, but now the background is much noisier. Increasing the lambda factors, and both these parameters should in most cases be equal, with values typically between 0 0.05 and 0 0.3, you can see we now get a perfectly smooth combination of sharp ridge function and smooth background signals. I would always recommend comparing your results with those obtained using lambda values of zero in order to check for the generation of artifacts caused by these non-square smoothing boxes. But used carefully, this approach can yield extremely good results um, for noisy data. That's all from me for this video. For more videos and tutorials, please visit the Falconel page of the Nanopaleomagnetism website.